Okay, so uh, let me go over some of the classes that I think you should take. <laughs> I'm inviting you to a number of new classes that I'm doing. So in the summer, I'm doing, uh, this is new for me, but I've already taught it under the guise of 101, actually. It's Eastern philosophy. So you took it, Nasiri. <laughs> it's the class I taught last semester, um, where we did a number of like Upanishads, Tao Te Ching. So this summer, I'm doing a, a really interesting class on Eastern philosophy. So I'm broadening the concept of Eastern beyond just Asian, right? I'm including Middle Eastern, and I'm uh, adding Greek also there. So we'll be doing some texts from the Hindu tradition, from the Chinese tradition from um, the Hebrew Bible, um, from the Greek Stoics, and then uh, we're doing the Gospel of John in the, in the Christian Bible, because it's a very Eastern text. And then what's the other one? Oh, and I'm finishing with Nietzsche. <laughs> so, uh, so it's a very interesting class in which we'll, it, it's different from what I usually do because we're going to be doing practices also. So we'll be learning in depth, uh, two practices. Uh, we'll be learning in depth meditation and also we'll be learning uh, the Chinese practice of Qigong. This, this is a kind of like dance. Uh, it's kind of movement where you attune yourself to nature and this is what you can see any Chinese person doing in the park in the morning. They're doing a version of that, right? So I'll be teaching you uh, the, basic, uh, um, the basic Qigong that is practiced everywhere in China. It's called the Eight Treasures. And this is really a set of eight movements considered to be treasures, right, in the Chinese tradition, specifically because when you do all these, when you do these eight movements, your body is completely uh, ready, <laughs> right? In other words, it totally opens your body, it totally irrigates every part of your body with blood, and it's really a way to energize yourself every morning. So this is the eight treasures that they practice in China. Everybody, this is the basic one. So we'll be doing that and learning that in depth and explaining also what parts of the body is being uh, nurtured or healed by the different movements because there is an intimate connection between Qigong and Chinese medicine. So we'll do some of those practices and then we'll do some um, uh, yoga. So I'm going to be teaching you um, the sun salutation. It's a very basic yoga form that you can do in the morning to just stretch and wake up. And in addition to these two practices, which are opening practices, right, where you kind of open up to the universe, we'll be doing some grounding practice of meditation and I'll be uh, teaching you how to meditate. So, and of course, we'll be doing these magnificent texts from the Upanishads, from the Tao Te Ching, the Gospel of John, the, the Book of Ecclesiastes in the Hebrew Bible. And I think I'm going to add, uh, ah, yes, Al-Ghazali in the Muslim tradition, a medieval philosopher. Uh, and then I think I'll finish with, I'm not sure yet if Nietzsche will join us. <laughs> so that's uh, in the summer. So I really recommend uh, you take it. It's going to be uh, a hybrid. I'll be teaching it, um, I think, a couple afternoons um, in the summer or two or three times a week in the summer. And then in the later part of the summer, I'm doing Introduction to Philosophy of Religion. Am I? No, I'm doing <laughs> Ethics of Love. <laughs> so if you're in a relationship, if you just broke up, if you want to be in a relationship, this is the class for you. You will learn all that you need to know in terms of seduction, dating, keeping a partner, struggling through difficulties with a partner, how to uh, bring a relationship back to life. We'll be dealing with all of these aspects with, of course, some of the best uh, literature out there, philosophical literature. We'll start with the Song of Songs in the Hebrew Bible. We'll go to Plato's Symposium some text by Rumi, uh, then we'll do uh, Kant, which you all know very well, <laughs> and then we'll do Kierkegaard, um, Buber, which you also know, but different texts, right? We'll be focusing on this text on uh, marriage, and then we'll finish with uh, Irigaray. So you actually have a pretty, but it's a different book by Irigaray. It's the book To Be Too, which I gossiped to you about so, last time. So, so that's the, the second part of the summer. Really recommend that class. Like, don't graduate without taking that class. This is the basics of, this is Sex 101, okay? <laughs> you cannot even be, imagine taking a, a starting a relationship without taking that class. I really strongly recommend. Not because I'm teaching it, obviously, but because the texts we're doing are amazing, right? And then in the fall, uh, I do the Plato and the Bible class. Actually, in that class, um, I'm fo this is a very interesting class if you're interested in a feminist critique of um, the Hebrew Bible because we're going to be focusing on uh, texts which I call, uh, which I believe belong to the mother's house in the Hebrew Bible. If you're, the Bible in general, if you're a Christian or a Jew or anything like that, you would know that the Bible's culture is patriarchal, 
in general. But within that culture and within this text, there are actually scriptures which are matriarchal, which have a very feminine um, uh, perspective and, and worldview. And so I'm going to be kind of, um, unbear uh, what do you call it? Um, the opposite of burying. Um, but you know, who's the opposite of burying? <laughs> huh? uncovering, right, or disclosing some of these texts, which I believe the tradition has kind of hidden away or has neglected. And these are the texts which have a very strong feminine flavor, very strong feminist take um, and, and subversion of the patriarchal culture. So I really recommend that class if you're interested in the subversion of patriarchy <laughs> and starting at the roots of patriarchy, which very often patriarchy in our culture is coming from the Bible, right? A lot of the patriarchal um, arguments that are given in our American culture, they will quote the Bible to you. So it is very good to know <laughs> that in the Bible that they are quoting, they're actually texts that are anti-patriarchal, <laughs> right? So really invite you to that class. Uh, it's upper level, but much easier than this one because I'm not going to torture you like I did here with the writing. <laughs> so it's mostly a class where I expect you to, to be alert and to, um, you know, kind of um, push back on what I'm saying or discuss, challenge. Um, so, but it's not so much going to be, you know, killing you with the writing like I did here. And then I think there is the philosophy of religion class, which I probably will do at some point, <laughs> which is focusing on the problem of evil. So if you've ever struggled with suffering and had it kind of shake your faith, right? If you've ever struggled with a question, if there is a God, why do people suffer? Why is there so much evil? That's the class for you, right? We'll be looking at eight philosophers and how they respond to this issue in their own way. Uh, we'll start with, um, we're starting with the book of Job in the Hebrew Bible. Then we'll do some Maimonides, uh, again, Rumi, I'm trying to remember, <laughs> Nietzsche, of course. Uh, and then the responses to Nietzsche through uh, Gabriel Marcel, Emmanuel Levinas, which you guys know a little bit, and then the different texts, right? And then we'll finish with Simone Weil. So very interesting class too. So you guys are invited. This, this class was the hardest. It just gets easier. <laughs> Any other class I'm teaching, it's going to be easier than this. So I really invite you uh, to consider those for the summer or the fall. Any questions? That was a long speech. I'm exhausted. Any questions? Good. Okay. Good. So uh, just the numbers of these, right? Philosophy of religion is 116. Plato and the Bible, 250. The Eastern is, I don't know. <laughs> uh, and then uh, the one on love, the ethics of love class that I'm doing is an uh, introduction to ethics, 104. So just so you know the numbers that correspond. Okay, good. All right, let's get into our text today. So I want to start with um, a couple, uh, one, one particular objection in your reading assignments. It's, it's, the objection happens right away in the text, so we can begin actually reading the text and then I'll address the objection. Um, I'm on page, where my X? <laughs> page X, which is 10 in Roman numerals. Where's my page 10? 7, 9, 10. Okay, good. So this is the introduction, right, to, to the whole book. This is where she's setting the tone for her project, which is basically, remember, this is her, her, this is her fight and her battle, right, to make the world, to, to, re, to, to recreate the balance between the genders, right? Because remember, that's what we said last time, once you have that balance, according to Irigaray, we can then begin to create more cosmic balance, right? This balance between male and female will, in fact, be, reflect right or is is rooted in the cosmic balance of yin and yang right and she believes that once we achieve this balance we will achieve harmony we will achieve progress we will achieve civilization right so she's going to of course start right away criticizing the western concept of the subject first thing she criticizes is the fact that in, in philosophy there is only one subject right if you go and you read philosophy they talk about the subject what subject is that <laughs> right and she She's criticizing this because she believes there are different types of subjectivities and philosophy has reduced all this diversity into one very Western looking subject. Okay, so her idea is that there are so many subjectivities in the world, so many ways that we dwell in the world, that we inhabit the world, whether it's a gender, gendered way or 
um, racial way, the way that we, different culture, different gender, different generations, even different social class. There's so many ways that we inhabit the world. And yet in philosophy, we only talk about one subject. And usually that subject resembles very much the creator of that subject, which is a European Western subject, right? So that's what she's criticizing here. Let me read the text here. Um, uh, and she's saying, actually, you know, we need to go beyond that. So um, let's go to the second paragraph on X. It is true. Are you there? Wave at me if you're there. Yes, one, two more, one more person. X, <laughs> 10, Roman numeral 10, second paragraph. Anybody else is there? Yes, thank you. Okay. It is true that I then have to renounce projecting in a solitary manner. So she's talking here about the typical philosopher who projects in this subject all of their own qualities, right? And if you look at the subject, it's a very male subject. It's very rational. It's very, you know, separate, distinct. It's very um, isolated. It's independent. And it's really describing not male in general, but the, ma the European male, <laughs> right? It's not describing the European female. It's not describing the African male. It's describing a specific type of individual, which is a European male. And that's what she's saying. We need to stop doing that, right? She says this, or in a manner shared by all the subjects of one epoch who are presumed to be the same, right? So she's saying we have made everything one subject and everyone is supposed to look like that. And she says, um, as soon as I recognize the otherness of the other as irreducible to me or to my own, the world itself becomes irreducible to a single world. And this is the key. There are always at least two worlds, just like there are always at least two subjects who are seeing or construct or uh, envisioning these two worlds, right? So I want to stop on the at least. <laughs> um, so let, make sure you write this down first, write the meaning of that, right? Remember she's saying um, philosophy, Western philosophy has reduced all of us into one subject, which looks not like us, but looks like the typical Western male, right? It's a rational, it's a subject where reason is the most important, emotion is, you know, pushed aside, that subject is detached, that subject is autonomous, that subject is solitary. They're describing Kant. I mean, if you look at just Immanuel Kant is, re is perfectly reflected, right? If you know anything about Immanuel Kant, right, that we studied, did we study him? Yes, yes, yes. We, we started with him, right? This is really, this subject is just reflecting the one that concocted it, right? So, so she's saying we need to stop doing that. There are many different subjectivities, many different ways to inhabit the world, and therefore many different worlds. And she says at least two. So I want to stop on that because I think one of you is complaining and saying, well, why does she say just two? There are so many more, right? Why, why is this too so important? And why does it have to be a gendered duality, right? Because Irigo, I remember, is saying we, mean, we need to start with the male and the female, and then we can look at the other di diversity. Then we can talk about racial or ethnic diversity. Then we can talk about economic diversity. But she says the root is the male and the female. So I think I was discussing with Nasiri yesterday, and she was, you know, she was kind of saying, well, we know, though, that doesn't work. There's so many other inequalities or, you know, other diversities that we should be focusing on. And just focusing on the male-female equality is not going to give us world peace. So I, I have an answer for you, Nasiri. I thought about it. <laughs> so uh, here, let me try to explain this part. Um, we have to think, okay, so let's imagine um, a European man, right? Let's, let's just go there, <laughs> right? Which, which, you know, kind of a, a typical man, you know, who is coming, has come, you know, European ancestry, whatever is, is there. So such a, let's imagine that such a man is a capitalist, right? That such a man is wealthy, that such a man is working, I don't know, on, you know, in, uh, in New York City, at the, in the financial, what do you call it, district, right? This man is, is doing well, he's, he has a good family, he's, you know, he's a conservative man, has good values, doing good. A wealthy, successful man. Okay. Go to this man and talk to him about Sudan, <laughs> right? The war in Sudan. Or talk to him about the famine in Ethiopia. What is this man going to say, do you think? Be real. <laughs> Suppose you go, you. 
Okay, it's like, what the hell? I don't have time for this, right? We're right, right? Most of these very successful men who are in Wall Street, maybe they will, you know. But in general, they will look at you. If you come, you, <laughs> knocking on their door, even you as a man, right? He's going to be like, What's, who are you? Did you make an appointment? You know? So it's not going to work, right? If you come now, if you come to him and want to talk to him about, I don't know, you know, environmental, ecological disaster, or you want to talk to him about, you know, the, the, the fact that in New York City is, is segregated and that, you know, there is this gentrification going on over here. How will he respond to that closer to home now? Is he going to care about gentrification, about, you know, uh, the way that we have segregated our city? Is he going to care about, is he, is, is, how is he going to respond? Yes, why? Because what he said is close to the Okay. It affects him. Does it affect him though, gentrification? Might, and, okay. A little, still, right. He might be more inclined, but will he be, you know, super passionate about what's going on in Brooklyn, you know, when he's living in the Upper East Side? Mm -hmm. Not really. <laughs> it's like, this is Brooklyn. Why am I caring about Brooklyn when I'm in the Upper East Side or Queens or the Bronx or whatever? Okay. Now, let's say his wife, whom he loves and hates at the same time, because that's how it is, <laughs> right? Between genders. Let's say his wife now has some epiphany and she is, right, she is really now, uh, let's, let's put it this way. Let's say his wife is coming from Brooklyn, from a family that's coming from a, a um, neighborhood which is being gentrified. And now his wife is dealing with her own extended family being kicked out of their homes because of this issue that is coming, by the way, he's maybe, I don't know, a construction person, right? So he's the one doing this over there. And now she, her own family getting kicked out and now she's going to address him and start to try to lobby him about this. Is there a bigger chance he will be convinced than with you knocking on his door? This is his wife. Yes or no? Probably, right? This woman, she's right next to him. This woman can destroy him, right? This woman has the capacity to ruin his life, right? This woman can give him heaven or hell. We know this, right? So he is much more able to listen to that woman because she's close to him, but at the same time, she's not like him. So there's two things that happen when you're dealing with someone who is both close to you and not like you. There's a possibility of opening up. Do you follow? that you don't have otherwise. Are you following this? This is really important. She's both different, so she will confront him on issues that he doesn't see, but at the same time, she's intimately connected to him, and therefore she can sting him where it hurts. She is intimately connected to him, therefore there is now a possibility of him being moved in a way that he would never be moved otherwise. Are you following? Yes. Um, this industry, do you think that this woman has the same her family isn't there, but she cares about it, and she's making the same amount of money as him. Do they still care? So, if she cared about it, right? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're right. I mean, in the series, is you have an ally here, I see. <laughs> you have created an ally for yourself. Yes, the, of course, the woman will not necessarily care, right? Mm -hmm. But if she cares, yeah, that's what it's saying. over if for she, that man. You see what I mean? <laughs> it's over for that man. So, what Irigaray is saying, is that when it comes to destabilizing patriarchy, because that's what she's up against, when it comes to destabilizing not only patriarchy, but white supremacy, it is only the woman who has a chance to get in there. You see what I mean? Because these guys, there's only one person close to them is their wife, right? So on that level, she's noticing the man who is in charge, who is in control. It doesn't have to be white, right? It doesn't have to be, can be, any country has this, you know, Man in control, you're everywhere, <laughs> right? So she's saying the only way this man will be moved to shift is through the woman in his life. Therefore, that's where she's seeing. The only way to change anything is on the gender level. Once you have that, that connection between the man and the woman, once the man is able to listen to the woman close to him, something will shift and become open and he will see everything else. Are you seeing what I'm saying? Let me give you an example and then I'll, I can hear your objections, which I feel are sprouting in your face. <laughs> right. um, remember Bill Gates? Sadly, he divorced, so it ruins my story a little. But um, Bill Gates used to be just, you know, a successful man. That's it. He made, uh, you know, billions on, what did he do? Um, Google? <laughs> Microsoft, thank you. Who did Google? Him too, right? That's the same, no? 
It's not? Okay, never mind. Uh, so he made, he made billions on, in his business, right? And he was just a, a wealthy man. That's all he was, you know, known for. Uh, and then we, we know, right, from, from you know, whatever, uh, whoever researched this, right, that he became a, a philanthropist through his wife. Right, she's the one who engaged in. She, she calls it pillow talk. Right? So they're in, in their room, and she's like, kind of saying, you know, I wish we could be more. You know, give our money more, be more giving, not more. But she actually is the one who opened up that side of him, the philanthropic side, and then made him who he became now, which is a, an extremely powerful man. Why? Not only because he's wealthy, but because he's influential, because he is also a philanthropist. Right. So it just goes. This is just one example. For Irig Rai, the only way to dismantle patriarchy is through the woman, in a way, through these intimate connections with a being who is also different, because that is the only thing that can touch that man, that can touch those men in power. Once that is there, once you have established on a societal level the respect of women, once you have taught men to listen to women, right, you have this opening up, which then can become a broader opening up. You see what I mean? It won't necessarily become a broader opening up, especially if the woman is unenlightened and doesn't care, right? But the, the woman right now is the only one who has an entry into the fortress of patriarchy and into the fortress of white supremacy. And all that is needed is an opening up of the man. And then more is possible. Doesn't mean, right? But are, are you saying a little bit what, I, what she's trying to say, uh, Nasiri? Kind of? What, what, what is your discomfort? <laughs> Exactly. Absolutely. No, so you're right, right? The way the way I described it is there are many men, it doesn't like if you look, for example, if I may say this, um, Donald Trump and his wife, right? So he, she is not interested in changing and she can't. Right? She can't change this guy. Even if she had some causes she was interested in. And she said a word here and there, it didn't work, right? But imagine if, she, if he had been taught to listen to his wife, right? I, what I'm saying is not even like, it has nothing have to do with if the woman is a quality woman, right? Just the fact that for one time in his life, he's able to hear someone else. You see what I mean? This is just such an amazing basis for him to hear more. You see what I mean? The problem with um, what th these very powerful men is that they do not hear. They are not aware of other voices beyond their own voice. And the only person who can disturb that is either their wife or their daughter, <laughs> right? You see what I mean? Uh, and, and we saw this with somewhat, didn't work with Donald Trump because his daughter tried, his wife a little bit, but he's very um, shut, shut down, right? So what all she's saying here is that the, 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 the only way to begin this work of opening up of these powerful men who are in power, of opening up a patriarchy, is through the woman, uh, because even if he becomes able to listen to one voice, it's already the beginning. It's, it's the way is paved for him to listen, period. And now they can maybe hear other voices. You see what I mean? That's what she's saying. Are you seeing more clearly why it's, it is a fundamental relationship? The male-female is... Because very often the male is only moved by the female in his life, right? And, and there's no other way of reaching that person. And once that male is taught to listen to the women in his life, then it is more susceptible of hearing other voices, even if the woman in his life is, you know, just like him. You see what I mean? Are, are you following? Because there will be times where she goes against, like, you know, she wants that house, he wants this house, you know what I mean? So it's all very superficial, in, of course, but he's able to listen. He's able to hear another voice. At that moment, the way is open for him to hear the, the, uh, the rest of the voices in the universe. So it's easier. Yes, Avila. Is this a case for men that are in power? Any man, right? So in that case, 
yes, this is always the question of people, <laughs> when, people throw me, when we do it, we go, it's so hard, right? Because she doesn't talk about it at all. But I think it's the same thing. She, she is, um, so first of all, um, she, if she were to write about gay couples, right? She would say it's the same thing. The, the problem, the problem, the, the, the advantage with gay couples is that very often when you're gay, you're in touch with the other side of yourself already, right? You've also been marginalized, so you've also been the other. So it's, much, it's not, whoever is man and gay, right? It's different situation than man and heterosexual because man and gay is already the other, already suffered marginalization, already more sensitive to hearing other voices, right? So she's really talking about the straight male the macho alpha straight <laughs> right and sh so for her i'm pretty sure she doesn't have an issue with gay men because of this marginalization the suffering they went through and the fact that they are the other voice right so at that moment they're already listening they don't need no woman tell them what to do <laughs> right close to you yes uh, although she's saying very often right why woman? Because woman is different and woman is close. That's why she's saying, oh, we're perfectly situated, right? We're both close to the man, extremely close, much closer than a son or a father, right? This is very intimate, right? But at the same time, we're completely different. And that's the only way to open something, right? So even if you're, so imagine you're a man who's very powerful and your father, okay, your brother, your son, but your wife, who's, you know, who knows you in this depth, she really has an, a, a key that others don't have, according to Eric Rye, right? Yes. Um, why is it like, uh, why is it not like, if, um, if the mother is receiving like the certain value and respect and he teaches the mother that's question, like, 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 <laughs> Yeah, I think it's, it's similar, right? The wife is the closest, then the mother is also tied by blood. But the problem is that there is no respect of the mother, right, in our society. The mother is very weak in our society. She has literally no say, right, in, in, in our Western civilization. Maybe in other contexts, she has more say. But here, so the mother is a little too remote to have an influence, unless, of course, when he's small right, she can begin to shape that because then she can, so absolutely, you can say the mother when the child is younger has the ability to open that child, right? And then the, if that fails, which it usually does, it, the wife can really take over. So that's what she says. So you can see how she's basically really, and this is maybe controversial nowadays, but she's really enthroning in a way the heterosexual relationship. Why? For political reasons. Because she believes that is the only relationship that can truly uh, trigger a change all other relationships that guy doesn't care right does that make sense a little bit that's where she's coming from um in any other this is a difficult topic this is a difficult perspective it's a dangerous i mean not dangerous but she's vulnerable to a lot of anger and resentment by saying that she's vulnerable she's making herself vulnerable to a lot of uh, critique right so is it is it all of you seeing and comfortable with this are you did i miss something because i'm a woman so i'm not saying things completely well for perhaps yes yeah she's not telling him oh well, how, how about Sudan? So yes yes she's yes so it, selfish Exactly. Even, so that's what I want to say. Even if the woman is selfish, right? Even if she doesn't give a damn about Sudan and gentrification, right? The fact that this man has learned to listen to a different voice than his own is a beginning. That's it, right? Even if the, the woman is, you know, like uh, Melania Trump, who doesn't really care. About, I mean, maybe she cares, but she's never mind. Not like her. Let me not put her on the spot. <laughs> we don't know what she's thinking. The, you know, she's so wonderful at hiding what she's thinking. I love her for that. She's, she has a very classy style. But even if the woman is completely, you know, superficial, whatever. The fact that this man is capable of hearing this woman, right, is already a huge step because now his ears are open, he can hear other voices. That's the idea. You see what I mean? So even if she's completely selfish, the fact that he's open to her says a lot about him and says a lot about the potential for him to hear more. You see what I mean? <laughs> kind of, I guess. Okay. Um, he touches I, I like this um, parallel universe, <laughs> which doesn't exist, but I love it. Yes. No, you're right. You can say that. The woman in power, it, only in that case, would be the one close to her can move her. So it's the same thing. It happens that usually the man is in power nowadays still, so we, she flips it like that. But you're right. This is the same principle. It works the other way around too. Yes. Very good. Yes.
Um, I was kind of going to say that, but like, it's almost insinuating that women are like the great listeners. Like, like <laughs> the fact that like women have just listened this whole time, and it's now time for men to just listen. Like, and I think um, it almost comes to a point where there's like, even in that, you kind of don't have a solution because let's say like something like uh, that's womanized, like cleaning or like cooking for your family, right? So now man listens, woman is tired of cleaning and cooking. So he does it now. <laughs> he does it for a week. And now he's tired as well. When it goes back to woman's turn, does is woman now saying like, this is my gender role? Or is woman understanding that man listen helped and it's just now your turn. There is no gender role being played here. It's just the fact of cooking and cleaning. Yeah, I think when she talks about sharing the world, I think one of you mentioned that it's not just sharing the public space, sharing the mm -hmm. private space. Let's share the household duties, mm -hmm. right? So, of course, she's emphasizing we need to share the world on a political level. Women need to have positions of power, but also in the home sharing the world, right? You Actually, a woman cannot get very far unless there is a sharing of power in the home. So absolutely, the sharing of the world has to also trickle down in the domestic space where they realize we both have responsibilities here. Otherwise, the woman never gonna get very far, right? So yes, I like what you're saying. That, that, I think that makes sense. Any last comments? Um, it's tricky, right? This is a tricky, tricky topic. Okay, so you think about it more, right? Nasiri, continue to think about it, continue to uh, object. This is very interesting discussion that we can have because she, Irigaray is, 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 um, is tricky especially nowadays where we don't want to think about the binary, right? The cursed binary of we don't want to think in terms of male, female. We want to broaden things. We want things to be more fluid. And I don't think you is against the fluidity of gender. She's just saying, practically speaking, <laughs> in order to really dismantle patriarchy, this relationship is the key. That's, I think, what she's saying. And it, it makes sense to a certain degree. But I can see why it, it might not be enough. Um, it's a good start, though. <laughs> okay, so let's continue. Um, now that I've spoken for a whole hour on this, <laughs> let's see where, how far we can get today with this. Okay, so let's go on um, to... Um, yes, okay. Great, now when I spent so much time talking about this, I forgot all the things I was gonna say. <laughs> so let me give me a couple seconds to look at my notes. Um, Yes. Okay, good. So second problem. So first problem is we have only one subject and she's like, no, we have many subjects, right? Second problem she's saying is that we are taught that the subject is rational and not relational, right? This is kind of the refrain of the course, right? West has thought that the subject is rational. It becomes fully itself through its um, intellectual activity a technological prowess, right? And we, and we have forgotten as Westerners that what makes a subject truly um, uh, evolved and, and developed is its capacity to relate. And so we saw this with Levinas, Buber, the African philosophers, right? So now Irigaray is going to give a version of this too, right? We have seen the subject as rational. This is the highest level for us, but actually what makes a subject truly a subject is capacity to relate, right? And so she, she says this on page X again, how the man has been done. So this whole, um, whole book really is, is um, kind of a, a plea or a lament to the men, right, in her lives, right? So there's not so much about women, but I will add some stuff about women too, because I think we also need to, there's also some refinement needed uh, for us. So X, um, actually, um, XI, 11. Okay, um, so go to the third paragraph, projecting. Projecting a world, everybody with me? Never mind. You know what? Go to page X, last paragraph, man transcends. Are you there? Everybody there? Man, wave at me if you're there. I need to see two people. Okay, thank you. Okay, so here's right how the, the, the notion of rational subject, right? How we become fully human. Man transcends himself towards a world in order to give himself a unity through a projection of all that he perceives towards a present but always future horizon. So in other words, she's saying man is rational. Man is constantly trying to build, to achieve with his reason, right? Trying to transform the world, leave an imprint on the world, leave a footprint on the world. 
uh, through the rational capacity, right? So he's constantly projecting himself into the world and that is considered to be a sign of success, right? And we see any man who has left his mark, right, is considered wealthy, successful, whether it's a, a mark of benevolence or mark of you know having buildings all over the city uh, or mark of right this is a way that you be you you you're seen as successful and prosperous right and she continues man needs such a transcendental project to acquire an identity of his own with regard to his origin especially his maternal origin so she's saying that this kind of going out into the world and mastering the world with my reason this is what makes a man a man right and she's saying the problem with this right is that yes this man becomes highly successful on the rational level but he remains crippled on the relational level and she's saying this actually hurts the man more than the women this actually stunts the man's true development because his sexual energy is not as refined as his intellectual energy right so in other words we have taught the man be intellectually there you know do this uh, well right, become an engineer, a doctor, a physicist, but we have never really talked about his sexual energy. And so you have these highly successful men who are really up there in power, but then they remain kind of very, very primitive when it comes to their sexual energy. I'll give you a few examples of that. Um, sorry, guys, it's, it's really, today is not your day. <laughs> it's, we're really, um, it's, it's, it's a bad day for men today. <laughs> yes, go ahead. Well, <laughs> I know how you feel. <laughs> I know how you feel. Tell me when it comes back. <laughs> okay, so make sure you write this down that we have refined, the man has refined himself intellectually but has not refined himself uh, physically. You can yeah, back? so like this is going back to like us and being something that's kind of like um, keeping society going. Like when you are so intellectual that you lose your sexuality, it stops um, nature. It what? Um, stops nature. Like, what do you it mean? Stop, it stops people from reproducing because you're so intellectual. Yes, yes, yes. Know. Exactly. So that's that's uh, one issue, right? The other issue, of course, is that the man ends up being kind of uh, crippled, right? So I'll give you an example. There was a great, great, this is a perfect example of that. Um, a few years back, happened in New York City. A few years back, there was a presidential candidate, a French presidential candidate called, 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 um, I forgot his name, <laughs> um, but he was actually, he was very well loved in France. He was an intelligent man. He was really going to be the next president instead of now what we have Macron, it was going to be him. He was um, incredibly popular and so forth. He gets to New York City and in a hotel, he violates uh, one of the um, uh, maids, right? Who are cleaning the room. Uh, he, he brutally assaults her. I mean, doesn't rape her, but really assaults her and she presses charges right uh against this man and you know whole scandal the man's wife comes you know nobody's believing the the maid right because she has some history you know of being um dishonest but nevertheless in new york city there was a whole outrage because we were standing up for our own against this very powerful woman she was a a woman from i think um the Caribbean. So there was a whole outrage of this power imbalance. And of course, and the man won uh, for lack of, because the woman was not considered a credible witness because she had a history of dishonesty and, and issues with the law, right? So in any case, this man goes back to, to France and it's, it's the beginning of his downfall, right? This happens already starts to become discredited. Already there's a doubt on him. People start to look at him more closely. And in the end, they discovered that he was the head of a prostitution ring in France. And he was organizing orgies and all kinds of crazy stuff, right? And he was finished. This man who was so highly intelligent and qualified for the job because he was so good intellectually, went to the best schools, but sexually had never really learned to refine that energy. It was his complete downfall. That's what she's talking about, right? She's talking about how the masculine is not taught in a holistic way to be a man is not to be able to be educated in a holistic way in today's society because we emphasize the mind but we do not cultivate the body right we emphasize rationality but we do not cultivate relationality and so these men become extremely powerful and talented and you know they are the top in their positions but they they are they are uh, how shall i be, pulled down by this uh, inability to master their own bodies. This is their downfall over and over again, 
right? And that's why she's saying we need to, the basis of civilization is not rationality, it's relationality. The man needs to be taught on both levels. There needs to be an attempt to refine his sexual energy if we're really going to progress as a civilization. So she says this here on page XI. <clears throat> Okay, last paragraph, projecting a world. Are you there with me? Wave at me, somebody. I need a wave, one, two waves, please. Second wave. <laughs> last paragraph on XI, 11, yes, okay. Projecting a world does not necessarily amount to attaining a human world, right? So she's saying, yes, they're very qualified, they're good at what they do, but the world they're creating is not a human world. And we see this, right? The world of... Uh, the wealthy elites, right, is, is very sophisticated, but it's, there is no, it's not a human world, right? The world we live in, which is driven by greed, which is driven by profit, is not a human world, right? Why? Why it's not a human world? Because we have successful people who have not understood the need to curb their instincts, i.e., not only their sexual energy, but their greed, their lust for power, and so forth, right? So she's saying we need to cultivate the instinct, not just the reason, right? I think that answers your question in the Kantian sense, right? Um, that was your question there, reading assignment, right? So furthermore, such a projection exists starting from the intention of man alone. It is thus, etc., etc. okay? So that's the idea. If we want to create a human world, we need to be, make sure that the people in power are not only rational, but relational. That's the idea. Otherwise, we will have a sophisticated world, which is a riddled with inequality, with poverty, with oppression and so forth. That's the idea. Let me say that again. We need to train not only the rationality of the men who achieve power, but the relationality, not only their reason, but their instinct, not only their mind, but their body needs to be trained. Why? Because we achieve then a highly sophisticated world. I mean, if you go to Manhattan, it's gorgeous, very sophisticated, high tech um, city, but it is riddled with inequality, with poverty, with mental illness and so forth. And so you have a mess in the end, right? So that's what she's saying. If, if, if the people in power also had been trained in their bodies, had had their energy uh, refined, we would have a city which is not only high tech and, and beautiful, but we would have a city which is also humane, right? Am I clear on that? Does this make sense? Everybody follow me? Yes? Okay. Um, good. So here she, she goes on, uh, X, X, I, I, 12. Uh, wait, where is it? Yes, here it is. Uh, page, uh, so go to the last paragraph, right? In fact, such a conception of the world and of human reality leaves only an illusory freedom to man himself and a spontaneity without any further possible transcendental realization. Let's interpret this sentence, right? She's saying the man who is has not learned to curb his instinct or his sexual energy, right? Is living in a state of illusory freedom, right? These very wealthy men who are on top have you know, not really developed the human part of themselves, live in illusory freedom because, and she has this, uh, the meaning of freedom for her is, is the same as Levinas. Anybody remember how Levinas defines freedom? True freedom? Is it doing what you want or is it something else in Levinas? She knows Levinas, so she's drawing from him, right? What's the, mm -hmm. Nasir? Yes, exactly. True freedom is moving outside of the prison of the self, right? So true freedom is not doing what you want. True freedom is escaping the small, narrow world of what you want, basically. <laughs> escaping the small, narrow bubble that is only you, right? And moving towards another and, and acknowledging another, receiving another welcoming another. This is how you move beyond yourself. And that for Levinas is true freedom. And that's what she's saying here, right? The, the, this powerful man who can do whatever he wants, right? This is illusory freedom, right? This is a spontaneity without any further possible transcendental realization. There's no transcendence, therefore no freedom, right? And then she moves into the sexual energy part of it. Uh, at least this is the case for most people, which can be appraised by the use they make of a surplus of energy, for example, of sexual energy. Now, this is interesting what she says here, and this is true of many, many, many men, right? This is, she's diagnosing, I think, correctly. She says this, an energy that could be unfurled as the horizon of a world built with a view towards a sharing of desire, 
So she's saying that sexual energy could be channeled towards relationship, right? And then it would build this magnificent world if it was channeled towards relationship, towards an I thou relationship, right? She knows Buber also. But instead, she says, it is expanded in secondary, animalistic, solitary, shameful, or warring activities. So let's talk about that a little bit. Right? So she's really, this whole book is really a diagnosis of toxic masculinity, right? This is really what she's doing. So obviously not all men fall under that category, but a lot do, a lot struggle with this, right? And she's really highlighting something which I think is really the case. So, so instead of the sexual energy, right? Let's go back to that, of being, uh, leading to a shared world, leading to desire, leading to a connection with uh, another human being, right? Um, instead it becomes secondary, animalistic, solitary, shameful work. So let's look at each one of them. What does it mean when sexual desire becomes secondary and how is this a problem? Let's try to analyze. Let's, let's go into this text here. What is the problem of, of a man living his life with his sexual energy being secondary? What's the problem with that? That's how we live. That's how, honestly, this is how we are taught. What matters is it? go to school, have a job, whatever, you know, don't, don't worry about that, right? There's no, I mean, notice, by the way, you go to school as a man and you spend years and years learning about the world through your mind. And there's not a single class in college education about how to master sexual energy. Am I right? Zero, no sex education, no nothing, right? Um, so what do you do with it? <laughs> Nobody knows. And we stumble through our relationships like, like animals, right? And we have never been taught how to relate. And there, but we're excellent, you know, uh, what do you call it? Medical doctors, physicists, and so forth. And then when it comes to relationships, all we can do is divorce and try again and divorce and try again. And we, we can't make even get married. We can't even you know, have a long-term relationship. Do you see the discrepancy? That's what she's talking about. We have achieved so much refinement in the mind and we are still so primitive in the body, right? And so you have incredibly successful people who have amazing careers and terrible relationships, right? Um, and she's saying, as long as this is the case, we cannot build a human world because a human world is built on the ability to relate. And if we cannot relate even to the most basic relationship, which is romantic, how are we gonna relate to the rest, right? So secondary is this, that's what it means. Secondary means it is not an important part that we need to cultivate in our civilization. We do not consider sexual energy something that we should nurture and cultivate and learn about all you have probably is the sex ed in eighth grade where you learn to put on a condom and that's it and that's it can you believe it this is ridiculous <laughs> this is this is nothing there's no teaching about how to work with a partner how to create a relationship how to deal with crisis right zero right let alone how to master and this is for men more than for women right how do you master that energy which is so powerful how do you channel it correctly there is nothing out there about that. Yes. Um, oh, was it you? Is it your hand? Okay, go ahead. I think here she's more thinking in living us in terms, right? Of freedom as self-transcendence, right? And I mean, Kant to a certain degree too, obviously, right? Because for Kant, true freedom is, well, it's still very much contained, right? True freedom is doing what I want, what my higher self wants, right? Okay, so that's for secondary. What about uh, animalistic? What does she mean when she says too often sexual energy in men nowadays is animalistic? What is she saying? Not always the case, but what does she mean by that? Yes. No, it's like a beast that can't control. Yeah, there's, there's no, it's all instinct in the Kantian term, right? I just do what I want. I do not know how to control this. I just follow where it goes when it's like that you you fall into all kinds of, like that guy right the the french presidential candidate who could not control and destroyed his career so animalistic in the sense of instinctive in the kantian sense that you you want what you want and you cannot control or curb anything back because you want what you want and in that sense you're still very much close to the animal in that sense yes uh, go 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 in something <laughs> um, could it also be like um animalistic in the sense of like that is purely physical without reason and the higher self coming into yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And many, many, uh, it, this is a situation of many, many people, right? You don't know how to connect. You cannot form a lasting relationship. This is the crisis of our times. Cannot form a lasting relationship. So 
you just settle for Tinder and, and, you know, things like that, you know, and just uh, quick hookups because that's the only thing left, right? That's the only thing you can manage. And this is in the, that level of you, you're not able to really create a, a, a sustainable relationship and you're in that level. Yes. Oh, in the in high school, right? They yeah, make them of all people, because <laughs> he's a conservative. I would think that he would appreciate. <laughs> yes, absolutely, right. This is again uh, investing in in the wrong direction, right? Yes. So we barely have any sex education apart from the eighth grade, where they tell you, you know, here are all the diseases you will catch, and then uh, including pregnancy. Right. And th that's it. There's nothing else about how to love. I mean, when, when I think about the ancient treatises on love that we have in, 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 um, in the world, right, you have Hindu treatises, Muslim treatises, all talking about foreplay and how to treat, you know, how to touch, how to, there's elaborate treatises that used to be written for men to teach them how to be with a woman, right, or how to make love. This is not, it's gone now, right? We don't have that. We have, we have totally other things, right? So again, same thing she's saying. We are not developing that. It is therefore remaining on the level of the animal. What's this third thing? Um, where is it? Um, ah, shameful, right? So then, yes, of course, if you, do not know, if you do not know how to sustain a partnership, which is the case of many, many, many people, then you're stuck with wherever your energy is going to take you which often you're not proud of, right? And that's what she's saying. And because this energy, you are not taught to uh, channel it. You're not taught to control it and to, and to refine it. Then, then I'm going in all kinds of directions, which you are not proud of, right? So again, you fall into shame. And finally, in the end, um, solitary, right? This is really where we are today. So this is a correct diagnosis. Um, certainly not of every man, obviously, um, because a lot of men are in touch, right, with, with themselves, but many, many men, because there is not a general education of how do you master your own energy, right? Let's, let's be really clear that that energy is a powerful energy, right? This is not, right, we tend to make fun of men because they have such a powerful energy, but this is really uh, amazing, powerful, creative energy, which needs, one needs to learn how to navigate such an energy. It's very different from women. Our energy is very different, right? But that energy is so powerful. If you do not learn how to master it, it's, it's, it will d destroy you and others, right? So that's the idea. And we are not really, men are not taught to um, navigate this energy. Unlike the Eastern traditions, right, where you have, for example, in India, a yogic practices to, to, to control the energy. In China, you also have these practices to learn to control your body. We don't teach that here, right? And so men are left with highly sophisticated minds and highly primitive bodies, right? And that the world that is created by such a mind cannot be a human world. That's what she's saying. Yeah. Yeah. Society has a system of oh guys don't try because they're guys and when they do try they're looked at weak they're they're seen as weak. So wouldn't that be like based on how they grew up? Yeah. We 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 teach them from a very young age. You have no emotions. <laughs> you should not have emotions. Don't be a pussy, right? What does this mean? Don't be a pussy, right? Don't be a woman. What is being emotional a womanly thing, right? So we cut them off, right, from this whole aspect. So you're absolutely right. And I think you should go on and read Bell Hooks on that, um, on her books on uh, masculinity, because she says exactly that. Men are cut off from their emotions. And so how can they love us, right? And, and the, the love remains very primitive because it doesn't have the emotional component that is, has been pushed down by the mother, the father, the brothers, right? And this is the issue here. Absolutely. Very good. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Basically saying like when you get born, once you're born, you're already put into the controls that she was saying. Like, like your mother does have an effect, but just the very fact that you see her as a mother is already affecting you because you already see the like her in a role as a woman. So that already has an effect.
Yeah, and very often the mother is disrespected by the father, right? So the mother is seen as weak, as incompetent, as a little stupid, right? <laughs> and so then you cannot really learn from her, right? So, so we have really a problem, <laughs> we really do. And she's right that as long as, so she's really trying, so now I really wish, I really wish some feminists would write about the cultivation of female sexual energy because we have, there is a lot we could do. Um, and maybe I'll touch on it. Uh, or do a workshop, I don't know, <laughs> on how, on, on our issues, right? Because it's not just the men. That's too easy to be like, ah, look at you animals over there, right? Um, <laughs> we also have, uh, are missing a crucial element. I, I really, I personally believe that the, the imbalance, the, the way that men have, have, have um, remained so troubled has to do with how we are in a way troubled, right? If we were good and put together, I think there would be a, an equal level on the other side too. So. Okay, so let's, let's uh, conclude on this uh, short section. Um, and so now here she's going to talk about, uh, open up a possibility of how would you cultivate that energy. She's going to give a few hints, and then we'll go into the details in the next couple of weeks. But where is that hint? Um, page um, X11, 12. No, uh, 13. X111. Um, go to the second paragraph, freedom, again, right? <laughs> freedom in a way spontaneous and autonomous with respect to the historical foundation of the world is able at any moment to be converted into transcendence. So she's saying this freedom that uh, man wants can actually be channeled into transcendence, right? This energy that wants to be free, that wants to be expressed can be channeled into transcendence. And she says this without cutting itself off. And here, here's the, the, the advice that she gives. Instead, projecting itself onto the horizon of a world, it must be, number one, safeguarded, number two, reserved, number three, brought to a standstill, number four, hemmed in before the other as other. So this is all about self-mastery. Right, what she's pleading here for, what her plea, her plea here to the men of, of her life is that energy needs to be mastered. If you are going to be able to engage in a proper relationship with a woman where, where you have a, 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 a healthy partnership, you need to learn to safeguard, to hem in, to bring to a standstill and to um, reserve that energy. Right, And she's, of course, here alluding to the Eastern practices of self-mastery right so and this is actually very good advice i think if you want to even be a good lover in bed right you need to learn that right you cannot just have that energy you know just there has to, you cannot love a woman properly until you have learned to master your own energy so that you can express it in a way that she understands if you go in there without having learned to, to control it it's not going to work right so she's really saying we really need for us to have a proper relationship, a healthy relationship between man and woman. The man first has to work on himself and learn to master that energy, to safeguard it. This is very countercultural, right? We are taught in our culture, you know, that energy needs to be out there, <laughs> right? You need to be sowing some wild oats and so forth, right? There's all these expressions about, you know, man needs to know as many women as possible so they can, you know, look. This is a high school mentality, right? I'm sure you heard it, like, where you're bragging how many women you, you were with the night before, right? So in order to show, see what a man I am. And she's saying, no, true man is able to control it, not just expend it, right? The sign of true masculinity, according to Irigaray, is not how many women you have, it's how many women you don't have, <laughs> right? This is very interesting, right? Sign of virility or masculinity, not how many you have, but how many you didn't have, right? Yes. Do we say that the universe is like open and that's fine? So then wouldn't that constantly be like having more like women in lives than women in lives? Yeah, but I mean, sexually. Right, more, more, right, the, the high school uh, feature that I'm seeing is a man uh, or a guy or a boy, <laughs> right? The more he slept with women, the more of a man he's seen in his peers, right? Among his peers. He went to Jewish school. You don't know what to do. <laughs> or did you? Yeah. Okay, yeah. It's different. <laughs> it's different mentality. But what she says is actually the less women you've slept with, the more masculine you are, right? Which is kind of the, the, the what is that in Jewish schools. <laughs> yeah. So you'll be more connected to what she's saying. But in our cultures, the more women you've slept with, the more masculine you are. And here she's saying, actually, the less women you've slept with, the more you have been able to restrain and hem in your energy, the more 
masculine you actually are. So she's kind of reversing, really trying to, um, I guess, yeah, create some awakening, right, in, in the cultural view of, of manhood and masculinity. And so next time, what we're going to do is, is look into how do we refine this energy, right? And I'm going to say maybe a few words on the, the woman also. I think actually next time, as we go into the refinement, I'm going to talk about both males and females. I'm going to bring in also the female, um, because we also need a certain amount of refinement. Okay, any questions? Are we good? You guys just want to go? <laughs> okay. Let me stop the recording.